Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the final day of the 2018 Gathering of Eagles. Today, we will hear from Dr. Guy Bluford and Lieutenant Colonel Kelly Latimer, two of two air and space pioneers. Uh, Dr. Ann Tipton will now introduce Dr. Bluford. Good morning, I'm Dr. Ann Tipton and I've had the pleasure over this academic year to get to know and work with Dr. Bluford. While he is most well known as the first African American astronaut in space, you will see in this video um, that that is just one of his, his exceptional accomplishments over his 29 year Air Force career. Retired Air Force Colonel and astronaut, Dr. Guyon Guy Bluford Jr. earned his undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering from Penn State University in 1964. After graduating from Penn State, Dr. Bluford was commissioned in the Air Force and earned his pilot wings. His first deployment was to Cameron Bay, Vietnam, where he flew 144 combat missions as an F-4 Phantom fighter pilot. After his tour in Vietnam, he served as a T-37 instructor pilot at Shepard Air Force Base in Texas. In 1974, he earned a Master of Science degree from the Air Force Institute of Technology at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. He then completed his Doctorate of Philosophy degree in Aerospace Engineering with a minor in Laser Physics from AFIT before being selected to the astronaut program in 1978. In 1983, Dr. Bluford became the first African-American to fly in space on the Space Shuttle Challenger STS-8 mission, which was the first night launch and night landing of the aircraft. In 1985 on STS-61 Alpha, Dr. Bluford led an international team in operations of the German D-1 Space Lab. Then in 1991, Dr. Bluford flew on STS-39, a Department of Defense Strategic Defense Initiative mission. Then in 1992, he flew his final space mission on the STS-53. In 1993, Dr. Bluford retired from the Air Force, leaving NASA to work for private industry on space-related projects until he retired at the age of 60. His distinguished career is marked by honors, which include the NASA Gold Astronaut Pin, Air Force Command Pilot Astronaut Wings, Luftwaffe Wings, Department of Defense Superior Service Medal, NASA's Distinguished Service Award, and four Space Flight Medals, and 14 honorary doctorate degrees. Dr. Bluford was inducted into the International Space Hall of Fame in 1997, and then in 2010, he was inducted in the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame with over 5,200 hours in jet aircraft and 688 hours in space on four missions. Please help me welcome Dr. Bluford to the Gathering of Eagles stage. Here we go. Yep. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure all of you saw that picture of me. I didn't recognize who that guy is. I'm still looking for him. If you see, if you see a guy like that, you know, let me know, because you know, there is an impersonator out there. I'm not sure if it's him or me, you know, whatever. So it's good to be here. It's uh, been a long time since I've dealt with Air Force people. Um, <laughs> it's been a long time since I dealt with Air Force people. Uh, I was invited to come back here last year. I could not do that. I really didn't want to do that. Uh, you guys wanted me to come in on a Monday and leave on a Friday. I could not do that. And uh, so they asked me to come back this year. I said I'd be coming back, but I can't stay any longer than two nights. Uh, and the reason why is because I'm married to a lady for 54 years and she's blind and I need to get home.
<clears throat> I'm thankful to be an Air Force guy. I don't think that I can uh, say it any other way. Um, you see these pictures of me flying in space and all that sort of stuff, but all of that, <clears throat> all of that occurred because I came through the Air Force. So what I was going to do today is to sort of talk about my career. I'll talk about flying in space because I'm pretty sure all of you want to know what flying in space was like. But I want to talk about my Air Force career uh, and uh, how I got there. People always come up to me and say, how'd you do that? You know, and I'm curious at that myself. How did you do that? And so I want to sort of give you a feel for where I came from, who I am, uh, that sort of thing, uh, and to give you a feel for that because I know all of you are going to be generals and, and you need all the advice you can get or whatever. A little history. I uh, was born in 1942. Though it's hard for me to believe that, but it's, I was born in 1942 uh, during World War II. Um, I'm a Philadelphian, take a great deal of pride in Philadelphia. I grew up in the inner city of Philadelphia, I great, played in the streets and playgrounds and all that sort of stuff, grew up in row houses and, and all of that sort of stuff. So I'm a big time city guy. I was very fortunate I had great parents, great parents. Uh, I had a father who was a mechanical engineer uh, who grew up in Kansas, I got a, uh, bachelor's, master's degree, and was a mechanical engineer. He worked in Philadelphia. I had a mother who was a school teacher. Uh, she grew up in the South uh, and uh, was t taught in the public school system. And then I also had a grandfather that lived with us who was a, a minister. He was a retired minister. So I grew up in a very stable uh, family environment. I grew up in an environment where uh, I'm a third generation college graduate. Very, I'm pretty sure that you stop and think about that, that's uh, pretty exceptional. Third generation college graduate. My grandparents on both sides are college graduates and so my parents are college graduates. So I grew up in a world where, hey, you know, hey, you're going to college. Well, I want to work on my basketball shot. Yeah. No, you, you, you don't have time for that, okay. Yeah, I grew up in a, in a community where we played basketball. I always tell people I would have been as good as Allen Iverson, but I had too much homework to do. <laughs> you know, my parents says, well, after you complete, you know, crap, you know, and, you know I, I missed out on that opportunity of playing for the 76ers. <laughs> so I, I grew up in that environment. I'm the oldest of three children. I got uh, two younger brothers, that sort of thing. Um, from a military point of view, interesting enough, um, not much in the military. My grandfather uh, was a chaplain in World War I. So you can imagine that in World War I, he was a chaplain. He was, you know, the, the military was segregated, so he worked with the colored troops in France. Uh, I still remember growing up, if you went into his room, he had a uh, organ, a little organ where he could pedal, uh, step on the pedals and play. That was the organ he used in World War I. Uh, I also had a great-grandfather who was in the military. <clears throat> My great-grandfather was a slave. My great-grandfather was a slave. He was uh, in Virginia. Uh, the Civil War uh, started. Uh, he was free during the Civil War. He joined the Union Army. He was a private in the Union Army uh, artillery. And, th and the reason why I remember that is because I have a copy of his honorable discharge. Honorable discharge, that's a rare thing. But I grew up in the uh, 40s and 50s. Uh, we were coming out of World War II. Uh, the two top technologies that were going on at the time were jets and atomic energy. You know, we were going to build a whole lot of atomic energy plants, all that sort of stuff. 
Uh, we had come out of World War II and we were starting to build uh, jet airplanes. And I was excited about jet airplanes. So as a kid, I knew all the, the airplanes that the Navy and Air Force had. So I was familiar with the P-51 Mustang and the Thunderbolt and the Lightning of World War II, the B-24, B-25, 26. I walked out here looking at some of these machines because I grew up looking at them. Uh, so I was excited about that. And I saw that transition from that to F-86s and F-84s and, uh, and jets. And I was excited about it. That was cool. And if you stopped, if you asked me, if you went, if you um, uh, went by my room as a kid, I'd have the model of every one of them. You know, I knew what a cougar looked like and what a panther looked like. And I remember the Corsair and all of that sort of stuff. So I was into airplanes and uh, uh, I loved airplanes. Um, me. But I wasn't into space. This was space. Okay, this was space. I would get up on uh, Saturday morning as a kid <clears throat> and uh, get a dime. That's all I needed, a dime. I would go down to the movie theater uh, and watch a double feature. You know, uh, Hopalong Cassidy and Roy Rogers or, or Lone Ranger or whatever. And in between the features, they had this thing called Flash Gordon and Ming. And so it would be episode 10 of Flash Gordon and Ming. Flash would be in one jam, you know, and, and, and he would work his way out of it, and 15 minutes later he was in another jam. And, and uh, you had to go back next week to find out how he was going to survive that. So that was my impression of uh, astronauts. You know, you go puff, puff, puff in this little vehicle. You see that little vehicle up there on the right-hand side, you know, that's about as much spacecraft that I knew, you know. I just, Uh, flyers. There weren't any effort. There weren't any pilots, black pilots out there in my life. I heard about these guys, Tuskegee Airmen. They wanted to fly for the Air Force during, or fly for the during World War II. They fought and uh, were able to fly during World War II. When the war came to an end, these guys disappeared. So basically, in my world, black pilots didn't exist. I mean, you didn't see them at all. Uh, in the 1940s and 1950s, you really didn't see a lot of black professionals out there. Doctors, lawyers, dentists, that sort of thing. So I grew up in a world where the professionals, school teachers, that sort of thing, were not black, they were white. And I was very comfortable with that, but just to, just to lay the, the groundwork on them. Uh, because my father was an engineer, I was fascinated with being engineering. I never realized how rare that was to have a father who was a mechanical engineer. You know, I just thought, why not, you know? And I think the thing he impressed me on was the fact that he enjoyed what he did. He enjoyed what he did. <clears throat> and I made a pretty interesting decision as a kid. Uh, and I tell people this all the time, I made a pretty interesting decision. I said, when I become an adult, I'm going to make people pay me to have a good time. <laughs> I've done that very well. I've done that very well. These are the airplanes that I was familiar with. You know, as I said, I grew up with all these airplanes. And if you weren't in my room, I could have told you all the specifications on all the airplanes. I was interested in engines, jet engines and rocket engines. And if you stopped and talked to me, I would have given you a little discussion on how a jet engine worked, a scramjet, rocket engine, a ramjet, all that sort of stuff. So I was excited by all that. My heroes, you know, uh, people, heroes or basketball guys or uh, sports figures, or uh, singers, my heroes were engineers. And these are the guys that were my heroes. The guy up in the upper right hand corner was Kelly Johnson. He uh, ran Skunk Works for Lockheed Martin. I still remember the uh, T-Bird, the F-104, the SR-71, the F-117, fabulous machines. The, upper, the guy in the upper left hand corner is Scott Crossfield. Um, test pilot, X-15 driver, uh, he was an engineer. He was a guy that I greatly admire. 
Lower left-hand corner is Jack Northrop, guy who started Northrop Aviation. He was my hero. He developed the flying wing, which morphed eventually into the B-2 bomber. And the guy on the far right is Dick Wickham, which is a, a NASA aerodynamicist. He came up with the area rule, which uh, was really phenomenal, because when they developed the F-102, they couldn't go faster than the speed of sound. This guy and asked them to incorporate the area rule and was able to do that. Uh, super critical airfoils, winglets, all that sort of stuff, super guy. These are the guys that I wanted to work for as a, as a kid. So by the time I got into high school, by the time I got into high school, I pretty much knew what I wanted to do. I liked math and science, you know. I liked airplanes. I was determined to make people pay me to have a good time, and I was going to go into aviation. And so uh, my thinking was that I'd go to some college someplace, I'd get my degree in aerospace engineering, I would go out to Boeing or Rockwell or Lockheed Martin and so forth and so on and do that. So that was my goal. When I went into high school, it was 1957, we had uh, Sputnik. Sputnik, so America was really shaken. Uh, the Russians put up Sputnik. Uh, in 58, they decided to do something about it, so they established NASA. Hey, we need to, uh, you know, work on this thing with NASA. In 59, they uh, selected their first seven astronauts, all that sort of stuff. So I saw all of that, and I'm pretty sure I was interested in it. Like everybody else, we were all excited about the space program, and we had to get caught up from the Russians and all that sort of stuff. But I never really thought much of it in the sense that I never saw myself part of that. I was never airplane guy. I was, I was an air, I mean, I was never a, a space guy. I was an airplane guy and I was an engine guy. So I knew by the time I graduated from high school where I wanted to go. I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer. Uh, I wanted to work for some company. I wanted to work for those, those one of those four um, aviators are those heroes that I wanted to do, and I envisioned that at this age, at this time in my life, I would be 75 years old, I would have a gold watch, and I would have worked for Boeing for 45 years, and I would have designed, be working on their 777. That was my goal. I mean, I just, I loved airplanes. So I went to, uh, in 60, I started looking for colleges, and I got accepted to Penn State. Um, uh, and I still remember going to Penn State. I, I got my application in, and, and they sent me this letter, which says, congratulations, come to Penn State. You're in the aero department, and I was thrilled. Thrilled. Um, when I went to Penn State, um, I had this little problem. I looked through the curriculum, and it said, ROTC, goodness gracious, what's that? Penn State was a land-grant institution. Uh, they had mandatory ROTC. You had to take two years of ROTC going into Penn State. Uh, and so when you matriculated in, the fundamental question they would ask is, is it gonna be Army, Navy, or Air Force? And for me, it seemed obvious I'll do Air Force. Uh, so I was in the Air Force ROTC program because uh, that was what was happening. The ROTC ta detachment, we must have had 2,000 people in it. We had a division. You would, you would uh, uh, sign up as a freshman, they would give you a uniform, uh, you take ROTC, you went to class. Uh, once a week you put on your uniform, you went out on the on the um, parade field, you marched around, all that sort of stuff. It was not a popular program. You can, you can imagine that on the campus of Penn State. So I was at Penn State from 60 to 64. Just to give you a feel for what the world looked like from 60 to 64. Uh, we still had uh, segregation in the South. We had the Civil Rights Movement. So all of that was, was uh, bubbling up between 60 and 64. I always, when I, when I saw that in the news, because I never, never really experienced that in the United States, in, in Philadelphia, 
I always consider anything south of the Mason-Dixon line and east of Texas was enemy country. I tried to stay out of that portion, portion of this country because I didn't want to have to deal with that. We also had women's lib. Women were, you know, making noise. And it was exciting to go on the campus of Penn State and women were burning their bras and they, you know, that, they get your attention. <laughs> you know, it's hard to, it's hard to study uh, thermodynamics when you're walking down, the, when you walk across the campus and you see women without bras on and, you know, it gets your attention. Um, the drug war was coming on. You got uh, LSD and all of that sort of stuff going on. The draft existed. The draft existed. So at 18, you had to sign up for selective service, uh, and there were people re being drafted. If you went to, uh, if you were on college campuses, you got a college deferment. Uh, but a lot of times, uh, towards the end, that started to fade away. So you had people who, when they graduated from high school, were drafted. And so that was one of the, one of the problems that uh, the military had. I was happy to see that they went all volunteer in 73. That was, that was pretty cool. But you had drafted. So you had to consider that, okay? And then the fourth thing is you had this thing called the Vietnam War. It was starting to heat up. Uh, it was an unpopular uh, war. People did not want to do that, so you started to get this, this uh, growing uh, discontent within the community on uh, the Vietnam War. I don't know if you people have seen the, the Ken Burns uh, special on Vietnam. It did a very good job on that. So all of that was occurring when I was going through uh, Penn State. Penn State was a very comfortable environment. I didn't see a lot of that, but I saw it. I saw it um, um, on the outside to give you an education. So while I was at Penn State, I turned 21. That was the same day that uh, President Kennedy got killed. So just to sort of give you a feel for what the world was like from 60 to 64. So at the end of uh, two years at, uh, at Penn State, you had to make a decision. Do you want to stay ROTC or you want to get out? Uh, and most guys jumped out. You know, it wasn't a popular uh, thing to do. You turned in your uniform, you handed it back to the ROTC detachment. They would uh, hand it out to the new freshman who would come in. So that was about what it is. So I had to make a decision. And uh, I made a decision to go advanced ROTC. I didn't really envision me being in the Air Force, making it a career. I just sort of went advanced ROTC. It made sense. I didn't want to be working for Boeing aircraft and get drafted, okay? It gave me an opportunity to serve my government, serve my country. It also gave me a few extra dollars to help me get through college. So that's, I went advanced ROTC. When I did go advanced ROTC, um, I could not pass the physical to be a pilot. They complained about my high blood pressure. I probably had stayed up all night, you know, partying or studying, and then walked in the next day for a physical, and I wasn't in probably in the greatest uh, shape. So I remember that uh, the Air Force said, well, you know, uh, you could be a navigator if you want to be a navigator, or you can do something else. I wasn't interested in, in being a navigator. So my plan was to go into the Air Force as an engineer engineer. I said, cool, I'll go into the Air Force as an engineer. I definitely want to be an engineer. That's all I wanted to do. Uh, uh, that is my passion. And, and if you take a look at my career, that is my passion. I mean, you know, everything else, everything else revolves around this fact that, hey, I'm an aerospace engineer. So I was going to go into the Air Force as an aerospace engineer. So things were going sweet and dandy, and uh, between my junior and senior year, I went to ROTC summer camp. And uh, uh, went up to Otis at Cape Cod, four or five weeks, it was exciting, very interesting, all that sort of stuff. One of the things that was exciting about going to Otis is uh, President Kennedy would fly into Otis, so you know, I still remember seeing him come in uh, with his wife, Jackie, and uh, so that was a thrill. 
The other thing that was thrilling was I got a ride on a T-Bird. Wow. That was cool. They gave everybody a ride in this T-Bird. So uh, that was a very interesting four or five weeks or whatever while I was uh, at Otis. At the end of uh, summer camp, um, they gave you a physical. Um, I still remember I was taking the physical and the uh, flight surgeon said, uh, why don't you want to be a pilot? I said, well, you know, I couldn't pass the physical, you know, all that sort of stuff. He said, no, you, you know, you can be a pilot. You know, he passed the physical. Most people were worried about their eyesight. No, I didn't have any problems with the eyesight, you know. Um, so I made a decision. I'll be a pilot, okay? Interesting enough. I'll be a pilot. My thinking at the time was, hey, I really wanted to be an aerospace engineer. That's really what I wanted to do. I'd be a better aerospace engineer if I knew how to fly them. I thought I'd be a better aerospace engineer if I knew how to fly them. So I made a decision uh, between my junior and senior year that I would go into the Air Force as a pilot. In my senior year, <clears throat> ROTC for me was being in the flight introduction program, FIP program. The Air Force had this program where if you were a pilot candidate, they would uh, run you through a program where you can get your private pilot's license. So in my senior year at Penn State, things were real exciting. I was in the aerospace engineering program, taking aero courses, and when I went ROTC, I went out to uh, State College, Pennsylvania, teamed up with a guy by the name of Ken Farwell, my instructor, and we flew 150, uh, Cessna 150. That was cool. I still remember that. That was, I still remember soloing out in the machine. Uh, and it was nice to be able to learn academics, the aero academics, and then to go out and actually see it in a flying machine. So, I mean, that, that whole year was uh, exciting. I still remember soloing out in the Cessna 150. Uh, the guy sent me solo a little too soon, I can tell, because I hadn't mastered the low wing. Uh, crosswind technique. I still remember that. I was, we flew around for a while, had a good time. I came in down final to land the airplane, and as I was coming in off the, over the runway, the airplane got blown off to one side, and I had to take it around. So I had to do that two or three times before I had to figure out that I had to line up just slightly to the right of the runway and have it blow me onto the runway, and then I had to. <laughs> that I had to have this discussion with Ken Farwell about, you know, I haven't gotten it all together. But I, I remember uh, soloing out. I remember uh, the thrill of uh, flying the airplane and uh, buzzing the campus at Penn State. There was, uh, I like that. Uh, I still remember um, flying the airplane with Ken one time. We were doing stalls, stall recoveries, all that sort of stuff. I was doing it, and I, get, I guess I had too much foot on one rudder pedal, and the next thing I knew, I was in a spin. And uh, I remember the airplane spinning, and I'm sort of looking at Ken, wondering, what's going on here, <laughs> you know? And, and my instructor just sat there. <laughs> you know, we must have spun, you know, I don't know how far down, but we must have spun a while before he said, you know, you need to, you know, don't put too much foot on the rudder pedals there as he recovered from the spin. I remember that experience. And then I remember going cross country. So I realized that I love fly. You know, hey, make people pay you to, make, make sure that people pay you to have a good time. I was having a good time. So I graduated from, from Penn State in 64 uh, with a degree in aerospace engineering. It was aerospace versus aeronautical because during the four years that I was there, they changed the curriculum to uh, accommodate uh, instruction in space. The only space course that I took was orbital mechanics, which I enjoyed. So I graduated with uh, a degree in aerospace engineering. I graduated with a private pilot's license. 
I graduated with a commission in the United States Air Force. I was excited. Uh, I also uh, happened to have met this woman in my freshman year who caught my attention. And, uh, uh, you know, she was nice, you know. And then uh, I stayed with her, you know. She was a sophomore. She went to the Ogons campus at Penn State. And then during the, my junior and senior year, she ran out of money and she was working. She was from Philadelphia as well. And so I dated this woman for four years. And uh, as I was getting ready to graduate, I envisioned myself going to uh, Williams Air Force Base, goggles, white scarf, and the Corvette Stingray. That was the plan, you know. So uh, as I was getting ready to graduate, this woman sort of convinced me that, hey, you know, you don't need to do all that, you know. We can just run off together and I'll make life exciting. So it was a toss up, you know, and she won. <laughs> So for all of you who are wondering if I ever got a Corvette Stingray, the answer is no. I always, I always tell people all the time I'm a failure because my goal when I was going to Penn State was to work for Boeing Aircraft and to own a Corvette Stingray. And at 75, I have not been able to do either one. <laughs> I ended up doing something else, OK? So. Um, the wife is also from Philadelphia. Uh, so it was an interesting adventure for both of us. Interesting adventure for both of us. So I sat around for two or three months waiting for uh, orders for pilot training. Uh, I was a bit apprehensive. I could have gone to pilot training in Moody Air Force Base in Valdosta, Georgia. I could have gone to Moody Air Force Base, I could have gone to pilot training at Craig Air Force Base in Selma, Alabama. Uh, and I think if they had done that, that would have made uh, pilot training that much tougher for me, because I was not used to living in that type of environment. But they sent me to Williams. Exciting. We went out to Williams. I still remember that. The wife and I, we didn't have a car. Uh, we didn't need a car. We lived in inner city Philadelphia. We got around on public transportation. The wife didn't even know how to drive. Where am I? Where am I? I've been, oh, okay. I'm making sure I know where I am picture was. So we went to Williams. I still remember. Order said, show up at Williams on January 15th. Well, I stepped off the airplane on January 15th or whatever. I got off the airplane and, and I figured I'd take a taxi to uh, to Williams Air Force Base. Well, hmm. not like Philadelphia. Hmm. So I eventually uh, called the base and they sent a car out and they took me and the wife in and we stayed in uh, the quarters. And uh, I still remember we stayed in the quarters and um, uh, pilot training started the next day. Goodness gracious. And uh, <laughs> Here I was in Phoenix, Arizona, or in Williams. I had no idea, you know, no transportation, Zippo. Uh, so I sent the wife over to um, the chaplain. And the wife trundled over to the chaplain and said, hey, you know. He, he teamed her up with somebody in the congregation. And during that one week, uh, uh, somebody in the congregation drove her around. Chandler, Arizona, she eventually found an apartment and um, we got settled in, no car. Uh, and pilot training started the next day. We had uh, 53 guys in our class. About a third of our class was West Germans. West Germans were coming through the program. Uh, they'd go through pilot training. They'd go from there to 104s at Luke and they were going over there. So it was an exciting year. It was an exciting year. I enjoyed Williams. It was uh, new for both of us. I envisioned I'd never been west of Pittsburgh, maybe, or State College, Pennsylvania in my life. So I, I anticipated that when I went out to Phoenix, they'd still have horses and saloons and, you know, you know hop along Cassidy, you know, all that sort of stuff. No, it was a very different environment. And um, I think the thing that struck me was um, how friendly the people were. Um, I'm an inner city guy. 
So I mean, I'm, I was raised up in an environment where you did it to them before they did it to you, you know, and all of that sort of stuff. So I, I, I grew up basically in the inner city, and I got out to Phoenix, Arizona, and people were friendly. They stayed high on the streets. I, I remember people saying to me, wondering, what turnip truck did that guy fall off of, you know? They stopped and let you walk across the street in Philadelphia, we'd run you down, you know? So, I mean, it was, it was a different environment. It was a pleasant environment. That's one of the things I liked about the Air Force is I moved all over the country. You got to get a good feel for the country. I mean, it's, you know, everything isn't like inner city Philadelphia. So we had a good time in Philadelphia, I mean, in, in uh, Williams. Uh, I was coming up on uh, graduating from pilot training. The, uh, the, the standard deal was the, uh, the major commands would send in people to uh, tell you about flying their machines. So we had somebody come in from SAC, talked about B-52s and 47s. Uh, we had somebody come in from MAC and fly C-124s and, and all that sort of stuff. You got uh, um, uh, that sort of thing. We had a guy come in from TAC, Tactical Air Command. He was out of um, Davis Monthan. And uh, I still remember he flew this F4C in and he parked it on the ramp. And I remember as a second lieutenant, I remember going out to look at this machine and I said, boy, wouldn't I like to get into that thing? That was the hottest thing on the, on the planet, you know. I just wanted to get my hands on that thing. <sighs> So, um, like all these second lieutenants, I remember going down to the um, auditorium to listen to this tactical fighter pilot, you know, about this, this machine. And so we were all sitting in the auditorium, and it's interesting. We were all sitting in the back there, you know. We were all sitting in the back. Uh, and this fighter pilot came up front. He stood in front of us, and uh, he was... Um, 6'2", 220, 230 pounds, football player type, you know. If you guys want to fly in the front seat, you got to come down front. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. He was a black guy. His name was Chappie James. That's who he was. It's the first time I saw an Air Force, I saw a black pilot. I mean, they're so rare that uh, this, guy, this guy talked about flying the F-4. You strap the baby on and light the afterburners and all that sort of stuff. I was thrilled. I knew I had to do that. And so he convinced me to be a gunfighter. That's what I wanted to do. So um, that's what I asked for. And when I graduated from pilot training, that's where I was going. F4. So I was backseater F4 uh, going to Southeast Asia. And uh, I was thrilled to get an opportunity to fly in that machine. That was thrilling. From there, the uh, wife and I went to Reno. No, I went to Reno for uh, um, survival training. February, survival training. I still remember that. I'm standing out there in the woods. The snow is up to here, you know, so outdoor survival training. All that sort of stuff. It was interesting. Eight bugs, POW training, all that sort of stuff. And then I went from there, the wife and I went from there to Davis Monson uh, so I can get radar training, backseat radar training. Spent three or four months uh, there. That was a very nice assignment. We enjoyed Tucson and Davis Monson, and that was the. And then at that point, I had to go to uh, Tampa Bay to go to McDill Air Force Base. And for me, that was, in, in, that was enemy country enemy country. I still remember that. So uh, the wife and I uh, put the kids in the back seat. We drove across the country from Tucson to Tampa, Florida. I think one of the things that shocked me was we drove across Texas. I didn't realize how big a state that was. <laughs> it took me a day and a half to get across the state from you know, El Paso to Shreveport, holy corn, you know. You know, I tell you, on the map, it's not that big, you know. <laughs> so we uh, drove across, and uh, um, 
Uh, we stopped at Selma, Alabama, to, and I was hoping to uh, stay overnight at Craig, and uh, so we drove into Craig and uh, tried to get overnight accommodations, and they did not have them. And then we spent uh, most of the day running around trying to find a place to live. People didn't, blacks don't live here. No, we don't rent to blacks. No, we, we don't accept blacks in our hotels, motels, that sort of thing. Never saw that before. You were, I, for the first time, I felt as if I was a second class citizen. And that was at a bad time because I was a first lieutenant. I had two kids. I had a degree in aerospace engineering. I'm going to pins, I'm going to war. In a, uh, in a situation where Americans really weren't that excited about it, and I was being treated like a second-class citizen. Okay, but we found a place. We stayed at Holiday Inn. I became a uh, an advocate for Holiday Inn for an awful long time. From there, we drove into Tampa, Florida. We faced the same thing in Tampa, Florida. We were going to Medill. I uh, got into Tampa, Florida, and uh, uh, looking for a place to stay. I was going to be there five or six months going to FR training. And people, uh, no, we don't rent to blacks, you know. The apartment guys would come up and look, oh, no, we don't even do that. I still remember dealing with real estate people. The only, and they would say, oh, blacks live in the ghetto. Still remember that. Um, we eventually found a place that was a uh, house that was going to be demolished. Uh, and the owner of the house would uh, let us stay in the house for the five or six months that I was going to be there. Um, and that was how we spent our time in Tampa, Florida. Went to F4 training, great machine. I enjoyed that. Uh, it was slick. But I realized. I was being treated like a second-class citizen. That I always remember. Uh, and I was going to war, and I had two kids. Two kids. But I went through F4 training. It was nice. Um, all that sort of stuff. I liked the machine. You know, I, I really, for those guys who flew F4s, we're all on the same page. You know? <clears throat> when I graduated from uh, F4 training, I was going to the 433rd TAC Fighter Squadron, 8th, uh, 8th TAC Fighter Wing. I was going to U bomb, and I was going to join uh, a couple of characters, uh, Colonel Robin Olds and Chappie James, who ran that division. So I was excited. I mean, I, if you're going to go, if you're going to go be a gunfighter, you want to fly with the best, and those guys were the best. <clears throat> En route over, uh, I took the wife uh, and kids to Philadelphia. Uh, they really basically got settled in before I had to zip, and then I went to Vietnam. The thing that I remember on the wife is um, here was a woman who um, had two kids, one and two, uh, who only had two, who only had two degrees and. We only had two years in uh, college. She was sending her husband off to war. She didn't know if she was going to come back. She didn't know if, if I was going to come back. And she was living in an environment where people, one, didn't, we were, she was sort of a, quote, second class citizen, but she was also in a situation where she was sending her husband to war and a situation where people weren't very popular, weren't happy about the war. So she, I have a great deal of admiration for her. <clears throat> in route over, I stopped off at Clark in the Philippines, uh, greenest place I'd ever seen. Wow, that was cool. Uh, and while I was there, as I stepped off the airplane, they asked the proverbial question, have you gone through jungle survival training? I said, no, 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 no. We need to stop you, send you through jungle survival training. And doing that, I, re I remember jungle survival training at Clark. Fabulous experience. Uh, the base is so big 
that the jungles, you know, there are Negritos that live on the base that don't realize that they're living on an Air Force base. They're just out there in the jungle. Uh, but I remember going through jungle survival training. One of the challenges was uh, we had, they gave us an exercise where you had to do escape an invasion overnight and then hop a helicopter. I still remember that excitement, you know. You, 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 they went to the Negritos and they, they, they incentivized them to run through the jungle to find us. Uh, we're doing escape and evasion overnight, which was exciting, you know. And I still remember I teamed up with some guy and we did the escape and evasion sort of thing. Um, and we got away. And I still remember him saying, we were, we were sleeping in the high bush, bush. the, the, the uh, uh, reeds were up here, and he was watching the rats run over me. And I was sleeping through all of that, you know. I said, well, okay. But I remember the next day we, we escaped, uh, and the next day uh, they brought a helicopter in, and I remember being hoisted up in the helicopter, and I just said, cool. They pay me to do this. Yeah. But I went to uh, F4s. Um, they, they, uh, while I was there, they uh, told me, oh, oh, we need to send you to Cameron Bay. Uh, so they did that. They flipped me over and I went to Cameron Bay. This is uh, 557. Uh, when I showed up at Cameron Bay, 12th TAC fighter wing, the 12th TAC fighter had, had all moved over simultaneously. I mean, they just deployed the whole wing over the CB, you know. Uh, um, um, prepared the ground for this airport, or this, this air base. Um, the enlisted men lived in tents. Enlisted men lived in tents. The officers, the pilots lived in Quonset huts, and the uh, senior management lived in trailers. We taxied out on metal tramp, uh, planking, all that sort of stuff. So it was pretty rudimentary. So it was, uh, it was an interesting experience. Uh, flying in Cameron Bay was uh, an exciting experience. It was my first real Air Force job. Back to CDF 4, Southeast Asia. Got to see the Air Force in action, fly and fight. This is how we do it, that sort of thing. We uh, did everything. We dropped bombs all the way from the tip of South Vietnam to all the way up to no no Hanoi and Haiphong. So I, was, I did it all. You know, Laos, North Vietnam, uh, Package One, all the way down to the south. Uh, there were some good things and bad things. I enjoyed the support we gave in the south. There was nothing greater than to roar off the uh, uh, takeoff and bail somebody out who was in trouble or to support the army or Arvin down there in the south. You'd fly him uh, to a place. Um, uh, the little fat guy would get out there, he'd shoot his little uh, rocket, said, put your bomb, and we did just that. We got out there and put bombs where we went, so that was exciting. We also had uh, machines, F4 machines, sitting on the alert pad, um, and uh, every so often you were assigned to the alert pad, you would live in a trailer next to the uh, runway, the alarm would go off, You'd run out, you'd jump in your machine because you knew somebody was in trouble and you roared off to drop bombs on somebody because somebody needs your help. Those were exciting missions. I still remember um, a mission where we dropped bombs at night. A C-130 came in, circled the, uh, circled the target area, dropped flares and you're peeling in, in between flares to drop bombs. See, that was, that made life exciting, you know, I, I enjoyed that. But we also dropped bombs in uh, Laos. Laos was uh, a different thing. Um, did a lot of dropping bombs on suspected uh, truck parks and all that sort of stuff. You wondered if you were risking your life to, uh, uh, for nothing. Uh, you dropped bombs in North Vietnam, you're wondering what was going on. The thing that, that bothered us was as we were doing that, the, uh, comp the, um, the um, 
uh, enemy got stronger and stronger. So there was some frustration along with that. Hey, I lost my picture. Oh, well, there's the picture here. Okay, that's fine. I'm looking, I've lost the picture in the back. So Vietnam was very interesting, very interesting. I got to see how the Air Force flew, you know, and uh, good points and bad points. Uh, we did well in the South. I thought we did poorly in the North. Uh, we were not imaginative, imaginative enough. We were not aggressive enough, and we fought as if we we didn't want to win. I was convinced that if we if if we if they let the if they let the military loose, we could have killed it off in six months. You know, I mean, we were. So it was that. But I took a great deal of pride in working with the 557. Uh, there were four wing, I mean, there were four squadrons as part of the 12 TAC fighter wing. We all uh, took a great deal of pride in what we did. We probably flew two out of every three days. Um, so it was very interesting. You get up, you go down to the ops office and uh, you find out if you're flying. Um, the fighter pilots, when they had the time off, we built a hoochies, you know, so you go down to the hoochie deal with some sergeant who had uh, in supply, he'd give you lumber, and each of the squadrons built their own hooch, and we all had our own little bars, you know. And, uh, so when you didn't have anything, you hung out at the squadron bar, and that went up, that went up, that went pretty well. The guys started selling drinks at the, at the squadron bars, and there was some angst associated with that because uh, the person who ran the officers club started to complain that we were competing against the guys in the officers club. They had to cut off selling the drinks in the, in the, um, in the uh, squadron hooches, but that was fine. That was a way of relieving tension and all that sort of stuff. But we took a great deal of pride in what we did and all that sort of stuff. I remember the fact that I went over with eight people. Six of us came home. This was war. Six of us came home. Uh, I remember uh, uh, a guy by the name of Larry Silvers. He got uh, shot down and killed just north of uh, Saigon dropping um, napalm. The other person was the guy that I brought up today, yesterday, um, Harry, uh, Harold Munlux, the guy that I went over with who got shot down and spent a, uh, was a prisoner of war for seven years. So. You know, this was a war. The wing lost maybe a plane, maybe one or two planes a, a month. And uh, we recovered probably uh, half the crew. Uh, I had a guy who uh, roomed with me who came in um, uh, maybe a couple months before I left who uh, uh, got shot down over in North Vietnam, which was interesting. He got, he got hit over in North Vietnam they uh, drove the uh, Air Force, they drove the F-4 out over Tonkin Gulf. These guys jumped out of the Gulf. Uh, he was in the water. He was telling me he was being shot at from the shore. The Navy drove a destroyer up between him and the shore, you know, and picked him up. They brought him back, and uh, what they did was they gave him maybe two seconds to think about it. They threw him back in the airplane, and he was off flying again. Don't think about it. You, know, you got six or seven more months of this. So you saw that. Yeah. So we used to kid him all the time. You haven't been in country any longer. You've already been shot down. Goodness gracious, you know. And you got nine more months to go. But, so. No, I took a great deal of pride in that. Great, great organization, great people. We were dedicated to what we're doing. I take a great deal of pride in being an F4 driver. So, um, I came up for reassignment. Uh, the Air Force sort of hinted at, hey, you know, we'll upgrade to you to the front seat, you know, all that sort of stuff. You volunteer for the front seat, we'll send you to Europe. Well, they reneged on that. Oh, no, I don't think we need to upgrade you that soon. And then they sent a bunch of guys who were backseaters to Europe and kept them in backseaters. That I thought was a bad deal. Uh, and I know guys who jump ship because of that. I really wasn't interested in, in that. Uh, I figured I had a choice between flying 106s 
or T-38. I wanted to be uh, home. I'd been away from home for nine months. You know, the wife never saw me for nine months. Am I running out of time? Oh, my goodness. Oh, I better speed this thing up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, my goodness. That's what happens when you put me on. You don't want to do that. You know, you don't want to do that. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll speed this thing up. So I, I flew, I went to Shepherd. I went to Shepherd. Uh, great job. Uh, UPT base, I was G38 instructor pilot. I loved the job. The thing I liked about the job was I was good at it. I was good at it. Um, and people knew it. It took me a while to be good at it. But you know when you're good at it, when everybody from the wing commander to your peers who all tell you you're good at it. I was good at it. Um, but Shepard, I had to decide if I want to stay in the Air Force or not. Am I going to stay in the Air Force or not? I had this degree in aerospace engineering. I wanted to use it. I didn't want to spend all my life, you know, flying airplanes. You know, there are people who love flying airplanes. I, I'm an aerospace engineer. So I poked the Air Force about it. I'm going to try, try and talk real fast. Um, and the Air Force guy says, well, if you want to be an engineer, you have to have a master's degree. I didn't have a master's degree. Uh, so I spoke with the academy guys, the academy guys really told me to take a walk, long walk off a short period. We don't need you. I spoke with the AFID guys. The AFID guys said, oh, you, you probably need to do a little more, more work on your GPA, because it was a 2.44 out of a 4.0. So I wasn't sterling. So um, I spent four years at uh, Shepherd doing something that I really wanted to do, but I knew that I was going to have to make a decision, all that sort of stuff. I worked for a guy who uh, encouraged me to stay. That's how I showed up at SOS. He offered me, you need to go to SOS. I don't want to go to SOS. I'm not going to stay right now. He forced me to go to SOS. I still remember going to SOS thinking, I'm really not going to stay around that long, guys. But uh, in 71, uh, as my commitment was coming to an end, I had taken four or five courses with the University of California, Berkeley because I was going to get out and go to grad school. Uh, so I started applying to grad school, and I happened to also apply to AFID one more time, and the AFID guy said, OK, we'll take a look at you, you know. And they uh, did that, and uh, I still remember in 71, uh, I got my Air Force Times, you know, everything. You want to find out anything about going on in the Air Force, you read it in the Air Force Times. I got this Air Force Times, and someplace on the cover it said there's a list of guys who got selected for AFID. You know, and I, oh my goodness, my name is on this list. You know, here I am about ready to deep six Air Force and, and discover my name is on this list. And so I decided to make an Air Force a career. I mean, it was really just that simple. I went through about six or seven years. You know, I wasn't sure I wanted to do this thing with Air Force, all that sort of stuff, because I really wanted to be an aerospace engineer. And uh, um, uh, the Air Force was saying, OK, we'll let you do that. So I went, went to AFIT. I loved AFIT. I did so well at AFIT that it even surprised me for a guy who got 2.44 out of a 4.0 average at Penn State, you know. Uh, about three quarters into AFID, I had an instructor come up past me in the hall one day and say, you're doing uh, pretty well. You know, you might want to stay on for the PhD program. You know, I just sort of said, yeah. My problem with the master's degree program at AFID was they had all these great courses that I wanted to take. I couldn't get them because I was going to graduate and I couldn't get to them, you know. So I applied for the PhD program and got accepted into the PhD program while I was still in the master's degree program. And the deal was, so I found myself in the master's degree program taking both master's and PhD courses to uh, finish it up, try to, try to reduce the amount of 
time I spent in classroom, and that worked out well. I had to choose a minor for the PhD program, and uh, I don't know what I'll do. Laser physics, how about that? I'll do laser physics. Had no idea. So I chose laser physics. I still remember thinking, PhD program, a few more courses, you know, a little, dissertation, a little thesis at the end, all that sort of stuff. I jumped into the PhD program and said, oh my goodness, what did I do to do this, you know? The most challenging thing I've ever done, anytime uh, people ask me what's the proudest thing I've ever done in my career, I got a PhD in aerospace engineering. So uh, I did that. Uh, uh, I left uh, AFIT, I went to the Flight Dynamics Lab to do my dissertation. These guys, I'm, I'm sorry, can you send me, give me about 10 or 15 minutes? We yeah. have five minutes. You gotta, you know, it's, well, these guys want to hear about me flying in space. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's what they're here for, you know. They don't, <laughs> want, they don't hear all this other stuff, for, you know. So, um, <laughs> so I, I did AFID. I was the number one guy in my AFID class on a master's degree. I went on for the PhD program. I knew I'd gotten over my head. Wow. But I was able to do it. Really stretched me. Uh, and then I got my PhD program. I got it completed. And they gave me um, a fabulous job. I ran an engineering branch uh, in the Air Force Flight Dynamics Lab. Had 45 engineers, two wind tunnels. We did cutting edge research in aero. We supported the SPOs. We did uh, two 2D nozzles, uh, aft nozzles. We worked on the uh, inlets for F-16. They came to us about extending the length on the C-141. The guys at Kirkland wanted to talk to us about uh, some of the aerodynamics associated with the Airborne Laser Lab. We dealt stuff. We did uh, work with uh, NASA um, out there on the West Coast in computational fluid dynamics. We worked with the guys at Edwards. We worked with the guys at Langley. I had a guy come in from DARPA who wanted to deal with the forward swept wing here. We did that research that led to this X-29. Uh, it was fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> but I had this problem. The Air Force came to me and said, you got to go back to flying airplanes. Oh, oh, yeah. I had been out of the cockpit for six years. I had to get three more years of flying. I had to get back to flying. So I said, OK, fighters, you know. They kept saying T-37, fighters. I saw that on the, on the tape. They had screwed up on that tape they showed. I, did not, I did not want to fly that machine. I'd flown five years you know, flying T-38s. I did not want to be a tweet driver. Uh, and, but the big thing is I thought I could do more in life than be a tweet driver. Why would I walk away from a bachelor's, master's, PhD, aerospace engineer, all that sort of stuff to be a tweet driver for three years. I could do more in life with that. That, that always frustrates me. You know, you got to be careful with these uh, personnel guys. You know, I think they come. <laughs> they, they, they spend too much time filling slots, but they're not working to develop your career. You got to be real careful with them. So, so, um, you know, in, in my frustration and all that sort of stuff, I saw NASA was looking for astronauts. I didn't know if I wanted to be an astronaut or not. I'm an airplane guy, you know. And nobody's going to select me for the astronaut program anyway, so why should I worry about that? But in the end, I said, I hate to be a tweet driver. She gets. <laughs> so I applied for the astronaut program, you know, and I figured, they won't accept me anyway, but whatever, you know. So I went through the uh, selection process. Uh, the Air Force uh, looked at a bunch of people. They sent 
100 names to NASA. NASA looked at 8,000 people. They went it down to 200 finalists. I was in Washington, D.C. when I was selected as a finalist candidate because I was there talking to the Navy guys and the Langley guys about aero. Uh, and then they invited me to Houston to do, uh, to do the physical. I, that was interesting. I showed up at Houston for the physical, and I was there with 19 other people who all leaped tall buildings with a single bound and walked on water. And I still looked around trying to figure out how did I get here or not. So uh, it was interesting. They gave you a physical that lasts a week. So if you're hiding anything, you might as well forget it. Okay? Then they send you through a psychiatrist, you know, and then you have an opportunity to meet these astronauts who are really cool guys, you know. And then they talk to you about this vehicle that they're hoping to fly. So all that sort of stuff. But I never really gave it much thought until uh, in January of 78. I was driving to work one Monday morning, and I heard on the radio that these guys had selected 35 astronauts. And I said, oh, I wonder who these guys are that they selected. And then I was at uh, work maybe a couple hours when I got this call from this strange guy named George Abbey who said, hey, you know, what's the weather like in Dayton? And I said, the drifts are up here, and we got 40 to 50 knot winds. This is the worst winter I ever had, and all that sort of stuff. And he said, you know, it doesn't snow in Houston. Would you like to come to Houston? And at that point, I knew I'd gotten selected for the astronaut program. Fantastic. Changed my life. It did. So 35 of us got selected. This is the picture of our class. Um, there were uh, 15 uh, test pilots who all thought they were the hottest thing since Swiss cheese, you know. And um, then there were 20 mission specialists. I came in as a mission specialist and that sort of thing. We had six women in the program, uh, all of them smart, super women. There were three African Americans in the program, me, Ron McNair, and Fred Gregory. We were all hot to do this thing. NASA was developing this thing called the shuttle. We we're going to fly this thing in 79. Just hang in there, you know, all that sort of stuff. So we all showed up. We were excited about flying. I went through the uh, training. Uh, they give you, uh, they send you through simulators, academic training, all that sort of stuff, which was nice and interesting. Then they uh, said, oh, you've got to fly airplanes. I said, oh. I know, I gotta get three hours, three years of flying, you know. Gate, we'll give you a T-38, we'll put you in the front seat and you have to get 15 or 20 hours a month flying t 38 I said, oh my goodness! 15 to 20 hours a month flying in that thing? Oh my goodness! I gotta run out there and do that. <laughs> you know, you know, just like Br'er, Br'er, Br'er Rabbit, don't, don't throw me into that briar patch, you know, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> so I spent 15 years with NASA. I got 3,200 hours flying that machine. Sweet. <laughs> you can't beat that for anything in the world. But besides that, I'm supposed to fly in space. They checked me out in the, uh, to do EVA stuff, all that sort of stuff. We flew the shuttle for the first time in 81. Cool machine. I wasn't sure if it was going to fly. It worked out nice. <laughs> you know. I was at Edwards when the thing came in. Dick, uh, 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 John Young, and Crip brought the thing in. I was representing ABC. I was their astronaut. So I saw that come in, and I thought that was cool. We had a machine. Uh, in 82, these guys said, eh, 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 Luffer, we want you to fly. Oh, OK. So I got selected to fly in 83. Uh, and this is the first flight, STS-8, first night launch and first night landing of the vehicle. Uh, fabulous vehicle. It was a crew of five. Dick Truly was the commander. He was flying for the second time. He had four rookies. And I was one of those rookies. And I was, uh, um, um, I was the guy, I was the flight engineer. I worked with the pilot and commander in flying the machine. I was responsible for kicking out the uh, satellite, all that sort of stuff. You climb in this machine. We climbed in at 2 o'clock in the morning. We launched out. You rock it up on the solid rocket boosters. Uh, it's a noisy, bumpy ride. You rock it up for two minutes. 
you go from zero velocities to about 120,000 feet, you go from zero to Mach 3. Noisy, bumpy ride. You hit Mach 3, the solid rocket boosters go off, very smooth ride, you go from Mach 3 to Mach 25 in six and a half minutes. Cool. Uh, we did something that was very interesting. We recorded the intercom. I'm going to try and speed this conversation up. I'm sorry, I'm slowing up here. Speed this conversation. So we, we recorded the intercom. And I still remember after we got down, they played the intercom. You know, we, and there was this giggle in the background. You know, you heard this giggle in the background. You know, and we as the crew trying to figure out what this giggle was. Well, the giggle was me. Oh my goodness, wow. <laughs> so you've, you're on orbit. This is the view out the window, fabulous view out the window. Zero G is spectacular, all that sort of stuff. I deployed a satellite, we deployed the satellite, and then we had to bring the vehicle home. And uh, I'm always convinced, you can always tell, this vehicle was designed by uh, Rockwell Corporation. It didn't have any landing light. That's why Rockwell is not in the business anymore. <laughs> you don't build a machine without a landing light. So we had to figure out how to land it, and we did it at night. So, so uh, after the flight, there was all this hoopla. Oh, my goodness, guy blew for leaps tall buildings with a single ball. No, I'm just a lieutenant colonel. He's part of this crew, all that sort of stuff. I went through three months of PR stuff. Three months of PR stuff. Uh, the crew, after you get down from flying, you, as a crew, you go around and you try and thank the people who made it, made the flight happen. That, to me, is very important. We did that. That lasted for about a week. All these other guys disappeared, and I found that I was the only guy doing it. And I was going all over the country doing PR stuff. Uh, this is, this is uh, one thing that occurred while, it occur while I was doing it. I uh, got an invitation. I went to the Pentagon. I had a special day. The wife and I had a special day. We got an invitation to the Pentagon to, by the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, who hosted a reception in my name, reception in my name, and gave me my uh, command pilot astronaut wings. That was fabulous. Slick. And I showed up in the morning. I'd never been in the, in the, biz, in the Pentagon in my life. Uh, I did this thing with the chief. He was very nice. I still remember all these generals walking by, shaking my hand, and I was an LC wondering, what did I do to deserve this? But whatever. I brought the wife. You can see I brought the wife. <laughs> what made the day special was uh, that afternoon, uh, I changed clothes. I went over to. Uh, the National Air and Space Museum. I joined up with President Reagan. We celebrated the 25th anniversary of NASA. That was special. And then that evening, uh, the wife and I got an invitation to Blair House. Uh, Casper Weinberger invited us to dinner at Casper at Blair House. I still remember that. We got into the taxi. We went over to Blair House. It was just a row house. Are we at the right place? You sure? Okay. You go in and you knock on the door. Oh, come on in. And so we were hosted that evening by uh, Casper Weinberger. Very special night. A very special night. I had a great deal of pride for all that. But I was having too good of a time. At the end of, uh, another thing. At the, oh, no, I don't think I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of the year, uh, this was uh, 80, this was 80, Three, I was hitting 19 years in the service. I was an LC. I had been uh, offered a slot at Air War College, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then I, I had mail up to the gazoos. I was putting, uh, I was pulling the plug on um, on this PR stuff. And as I was fishing through the mail, I got this letter from the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel, and the letter said, "Congratulations, blah 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 blah." You've been promoted to 06. So I said, <laughs> President got involved in that, and I got promoted. So I had 19 years, I was 06. Very, and then I had to make a decision. Do I return to the Air Force? What do I do? All that sort of stuff. Well, the first thing I wanted to do is fly one more time. 
I love flying in space. Uh, I adapt easily. I don't get sick. I like the zero G, the view out the window, all that sort of stuff. They turned me around and put me on 61 Alpha. So this is the second flight. I teamed up with three European astronauts and went to Europe. Um, I learned how to do a whole different, whole lot of experiments, uh, fluid physics, crystal growing, physiology, all that sort of stuff. And in uh, 85, I flew in space for the second time on uh, Space Lab. I ran sort of the Space Lab operation. We had 76 different experiments. Uh, we worked 24 hours shift. We worked 12 hour shifts. And so here I was, I worked with Ernst Measurement. We did all sorts of experiments. I'm speeding it up. I'm working. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Okay, 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 I'll, I'll I flew on STS-39. <laughs> There's STS-39, SDIO guys, I enjoyed that. STS-53, which was classified, I'd be able to, that was a classified DOD, I'd be happy to tell you about that, I'd have to shoot all of you, some of you. <laughs> some of you, that was the crew of that. Uh, and uh, that was the wife that made it happen. I uh, had to retire, I was coming up on retirement, you know, they do throw you out of the Air Force. And I knew I was coming up on that, so I had to uh, leave. So I uh, looked around, I found a guy by the name of Fig Newton, fellow flyer, and he handed, he did the retirement for me. So uh, I was always appreciative of that. I'm an Air Force officer. Take a great deal. <laughs> take a great deal of pride in being that. Though I've wandered off to NASA for 15 years and I've, I've worked in industry of, of which I enjoyed, I still remind myself that I, I take a great deal of pride in being one of you. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bluford. <laughs>